Thank you for listening to the Allender Center podcast. I'm Dr. Dan Allender. And I'm Rachel Clinton Chen. We're fiercely committed to providing hope and healing to a fragmented world. And restoration for the heart. Thank you for joining us. Let's get this conversation started. We don't often say this, but the Allender Center is under the umbrella of the profoundly wonderful Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. And we don't really get a chance to talk with folks that often teach there. So, Rachel, we've got incredible privilege of not only the person, but also uh, the program uh, that we'll be talking about today. But to have J.P. Kong, Dr. J.P. Kong, uh, who is an affiliate faculty teaching uh, the Bible, uh, but also uh, the head pastor of the Japanese Presbyterian Church in Seattle with us. J.P., it's just an honor and delight to have you with us. Thank you. I personally feel very um grateful and energized to do the work that I get to do both in a congregational setting as well as at the Seattle School. Um, it is nothing like when I was in seminary in the 1990s, uh, but my own development as both a person, a you know, preacher, teacher, um, have enabled me to see no shortage of ways in which the Bible speaks to the, the present age, both in among the pews as well as in the classroom and out on the street. And so, um, yeah, I, I just think it is so vital that uh, people are given the tools, especially those who have come from what we might call spiritually toxic backgrounds, folks That's who right. have had way too much Bible, who, who don't want to have anything to do with it, That's right. to be given um, a reason to and a curiosity, the tools to go back and see things that they've never seen before. Yeah, I love I love that phrase. Uh, people who have, in one sense, borne a toxicity, uh, uh, in one sense, something foul from the very life giving presence of God in the Bible. So, yeah. how, how how now uh, do you engage the, the issue of the toxicity of 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 what people have taken in? Yeah, I, I tell my students uh, the first day, first week of class that this is not Bible study 2.0. It's not the way that they've approached Scripture in in a at, in, you know previous uh, church setting or you know perhaps faith based uh, educational institution. I think that what I'm trying to do is help students become better readers, both of the text and of their context of themselves, and I try to accomplish that by, um, you know, asking kind of provocative questions that, in, that uh, trigger curiosity. Uh, I try to use humor. And I, I pay really as much attention as I can to the emotional dynamics of the act of reading. So, and in that way, I find that students, um, many students do respond. I, I, again, uh, to use another phrase, a lot of my students over the last 10, 11 years that I've been teaching at the Seattle School could be characterized as recovering fundamentalists. So that's, I, you know, I put myself in their shoes, remembering what it was like when I was going through my own deconstruction many years ago. Yeah, I just, what it makes me think about is, I don't know if many of our listeners know this, but I actually have a, um, my undergraduate degree is in biblical studies. So a Bachelor of Arts in Religion with an emphasis in biblical studies from Oklahoma Baptist University, which is a liberal arts school. And I would say like for myself as a recovering fundamentalist, that educational pathway not only was part of my vocational calling, but it actually like saved my life. I think it saved my life because I had professors inviting me to, yeah, deconstructions. I know such a scary word for people because it feels like, what does that mean? But in many ways, they were so gracious because we were these, you know, very indoctrinated kids who had learned to have a relationship with the Bible as if it had just fallen out of the sky, perfectly intact, directly from God, um, but also were, you know, 
wrestling and had really good questions. And I feel like they just kept opening doors and windows and saying, oh, here's an interpretive tool for you to, here's a good, keep asking more questions. But in a way that I look back now and say, oh my gosh, they were doing such stunning work, not deceptively, but actually really kindly. And I think for me, it really, like the Bible did become um, God through the Bible became so much more of, I think, the true God that I was meant to be encountering along the way. And it's just, it's always been a little paradoxical for me because, you know, when you're coming out of a kind of more, and I have a lot of fondness for a lot of my Southern Baptist upbringing. I mean, I am rich in the word as far as like it being a part of like just in my body. Um, But when you're coming from environments, we have such a tendency in our society to want to split off as if that will keep us safe and or will help us mend. But in splitting off like that, we often have to split off really good parts of ourselves and things that we actually need for Mm -hmm. the road ahead and the journey ahead. So just your words about ways in which you engage students is deeply encouraging to me. So provoke us. I, I want to. I want to hear a provocative question that you would invite your students to engage. Well, let me let me tell a story. The very first year I taught at the Seattle School, uh, in my it was a, the Old Testament genre class at the time, uh, which was a precursor of the bi- biblical survey that's part of the certificate. I put as the final assignment. This was the first time I was teaching the course. I said you can write a paper on any figure or text in the Bible uh, that perhaps has bothered you or that you feel like you, there's nothing new to learn there. So I want you to have the experience of maybe surprising yourself with the new tools and approaches. And most students don't look at that till like the last month of the course. But I had a MA uh, counseling student come in the second week for office hour. And she said, I want to look at the story of Samuel and Hannah, the, the calling of Samuel. And I said, oh, okay. Um, is, you know what? What are you interested in there? And she said, "Well, I I wonder. I've been reading that uh, in the literature, psychological literature, that children who are abandoned report hearing voices." And I said, "Oh, say more." She goes, "I want to read the story of Samuel's development as a story of abandonment. Right. How did his being left by his mother at such a young age influence his later life and relationships?" I said, "Go for it." And the light bulb went on for me in that moment that that kind of question, that interdisciplinary question, would only be asked in a setting like the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. I, I, I would have a hard time thinking about it happening in the settings where I got my own formation, where you know there was some counseling, pastoral counseling, psychology, but it was definitely not central. No, that's stunning. That well, that's that, another way of putting it. Is where you were provoked by mm-hmm. a really wise and kind question. But we, and I'm sure there's an armamentarium of questions that you pose for your students. But nonetheless, like, do you have one or two that you generally like? This is something I want you all to have to think about. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll tell you, first week of class, we look at Genesis 1, 1 to 3, and I give it to them in multiple translations. I want them to get up close and personal with the text. So they look at the King James, they look at contemporary translations, they look at Robert Alter, and I ask them, just, you know, I've laid it out in parallel, what do you notice? What do you see? And they notice punctuation, they notice uh, verb tenses, they notice uh, grammar, they notice, you know, different translations for the word, um, Hebrew word ruach, right? spirit, breath, wind, they all feel and land differently depending on the translation. And so we work through that together. And then I ask the students, well, how does this change your understanding of God as creator? Because if there's a period at the end of verse one, God is done, everything's finished. But if verses one to three are one long sentence, and the verse two, now the earth was, you know, formless and void or welter and waste. If that's just kind of the circumstance, it's a very, very different understanding of God as creator or what's being described. That's so fun. It is so fun. If there's a period, it's done. Uh, and yeah, 
the the process of mm -hmm. allowing in so many ways the the word to be engaged with not a fundamentally critical eye but an eye of just curiosity uh, feels like absolutely a, a core gift that i know as i speak to our students what they have said again and again is uh, the two words that come up um with regard to you one is you are a profoundly kind man um and in that uh but also you are provocative you invite people into a process of um curiosity and sometimes curiosity seems to have killed the feline uh, oh. presence and so there's a danger uh in curiosity uh that um, as we come to the word, so many people want a finality. Uh, mm -hmm. They want mm -hmm. the period versus the implication of what a long run-on sentence might actually mm -hmm. include. So I, I'm, I would love for you to put words to, like, how did you get into the Bible? Yeah. Um, well, I was born uh, the, the firstborn child of a Presbyterian missionary pastor couple. Uh, and so I grew up overseas, uh, mostly uh, three years in Africa and then about a decade in Japan. And the Bible was, you know, present in our home. We read it together as a family. We, you know, we had prayers before meals like, like many, many do. And then when I went to college, I had this experience of kind of deep spiritual hunger kind of crisis that precipitated a formal confession of faith. And that was the point at freshman year and end of freshman year in college, I started to grow. Like I read as much as I could about Bible and theology and history as much as I could, you know, absorb as a, a young person. And around my junior year, I discerned, oh, I think perhaps I'm being called to go to seminary and maybe to teach. It was very, very kind of fuzzy notion at that time. So I ended up at Princeton Seminary in uh, the fall of 1992. And very quickly, I realized that um, I had I, I knew very little about the background of the Bible. Like I had been reading it in English, and I didn't know about the history. I didn't know about the languages, and I had to take Greek and then Hebrew. And that it was really under the influence of my the faculty at Princeton Seminary uh, in New Jersey, who modeled what it was to be incredibly rigorous, sort of uh, with the technical disciplines of you know, language and translation and textual criticism uh, and comparative method, along with doing that in the service of the church. So that was my long journey. I, I went, to, went on to do a doctorate in uh, Bible, focusing on Hebrew Bible. I produced, my study produced a dictionary of the Hebrew inscriptions that, are, um, that have been dug up in the ground that are contemporary to the biblical period. And so I bring all of that. The, the, I tell my students I'm a word nerd. I'm obsessed with words and meanings and, you know, syntax and, and grammar. Um, but I, I definitely do not teach the way I was taught, right? I, I realize that I'm not here to make, you know, train biblical scholars as much as I am people who have a living relationship with the text who can use it as a, a resource for their work as artists, as therapists, as, you know, some of them as pastors. Well, I know Rachel. Your 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 face. I wish people could see your face as JP talks about being a nerd. <laughs> oh, I just you know I actually say a lot of times before I teach because you know at the Allender Center people assume you're a trained therapist, and I have a Master of Divinity from the Seattle School. And JP, you came right after I finished, but then mm -hmm. I worked recruiting students to the MDiv program. So I got to hear a lot about you through the students oh. that were coming into the school. Um, but I I laugh because I just have, I love biblical studies. And I often say to people, like, I love the Bible. And that doesn't mean I love everything in it or that I don't wrestle with it or that I'm not confounded by it. And um, I just, mostly what was coming up for me is my own word nerdness and how often it's gotten me in so much trouble in my studies and I feel like Jesus has used this to humble me in case anyone, lest anyone think of me as an expert. Like, for example, 
at the Seattle School in my New Testament or in Romans. We had to do an exegetical paper. And I actually failed it the first time around because I could not finish it because I, like normal, was like, mm, what do I want to wrestle with? Okay, let's look at Romans 3.22. Is it the faith in Christ or the faith of Christ that matters? Because that has huge theological implications for what totally. we're talking about with salvation. So, you know, it was like I entered my own. I'm just laughing at the amount of times my desire to like get close has actually led to like deep existential crises, good ones of mm -hmm. wrestling that didn't often happen in the timeline of my academic requirements. I no passed way. it the second uh -huh. time around. But yeah, all that to say, I think um, part of what I think about a lot, especially in our current context, as we kind of make a shift, like why would someone want to get a certificate in scripture and society? Like what, you know, what are some of the tools and gifts and, you know, not just academically, not just mentally, but emotionally and spiritually that someone could get? Like part of why I'm very passionate about the Bible is because, like I mentioned, growing up in a more fundamentalist environment and relationship with the text. And I grew up in Oklahoma. And even just this past summer, Oklahoma superintendent, Ryan Walters, I think that's his name. I sometimes try to forget it. Yeah, Ryan Walters, um, because he is leaning very hard into Christian nationalism. And he's kind of a lot of the playbook, which wants to, you know, dismantle the Department of Education, push people towards private religious education but basically made a mandate that all Oklahoma school teachers, all Oklahoma classrooms incorporate the Bible in lesson plans from grade five to 12. And I have a cousin who is a computer teacher and a baseball coach in Oklahoma, and he's really funny. And right after this mandate came out, I actually have a lot of people in education in Oklahoma. He His Instagram title is just a computer teacher. <laughs> and so he wrote, he kind of came out and said, well, I guess I'm now just a computer teacher and a Bible teacher. And I think that that what bothered me about this mandate, one, let alone that it's like a violation of the Constitution, it's that there's this assumption that just any person without any training, without any of like the tools and frameworks that are really needed to understand how the Bible even functions, are just supposed to get up and teach the Bible. Like it just has a lot of power to shape our imagination. And I actually take that very seriously anytime I'm approaching the Word of God that's a huge responsibility. It's not a, you know, it's not meant to be like so such a responsibility that we're frozen and we can't utilize it. But it's like, no, this actually necessitates like a serious, thoughtful, um, like engagement and understanding of the implications on imagination, how we're being shaped. Yeah. What, what I would say is, um, like you, I resonate very strongly that there is, um, there's such a need to correlate scripture and society. Um, I, if it wasn't clear, like I focused on the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament. And part of my reason for doing that is to provide somewhat of a corrective voice to the overemphasis on the New Testament in most Christian right. settings. I, I use the analogy of music. I talk about how, you know, if Jesus is a new song that God is singing, you really cannot understand or appreciate that melody without the harmony of the Hebrew scriptures, right? Jesus was Jewish. And so if you don't know what the law and the writings say, you, you, you don't get what Jesus is saying about the greatest commandments, right? That's right. So um, again, part of the approach that I use, uh, because of my training in comparative ancient Near Eastern and other you know, cultural backgrounds, is it simultaneously makes the text, as we look at it, uh, stranger, more foreign, right? Students many times have not been exposed to this Mesopotamian, Egyptian, Canaanite uh, context. And so in making the Bible seem different from how they had read it before, say, you know, in a popular English translation, they also gain kind of a respect for the historical and cultural distance between a 21st century reader and that first century or, you know, uh, 3,000 year old text. And so I think that's healthy for the reader, right? I, 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 I need help reading the Bible. I can't just pick up a text and say, I know all the stuff I need specialists and commentators. And so students hopefully come out with more humility in their approach to the text. And to pick up uh, or reference something earlier in the conversation, uh, 
you know, you want them to engage their curiosity and their imagination because it, I mean, you have to, because the biblical writers did not provide every last detail and motivation that we would want to know. But Dan, as you point out, that process of engaging that can be very frightening. There's a lot of fear. And, and so I'm, I attend to that in my classes when students start raising these kinds of personal, spiritual, theological questions like, well, if that's not true or if it's not literal, then what does that do about to my, potentially do to my conviction about the reality or the existence of God or some, some related kind of existential question? Just so well important to be able to say that, as you said earlier, that our own experience, we are a reader, but we bring bias, prejudice, often that we don't even know. We bring assumptions that we've not really even had articulated, the, the core presuppositional base of how we enter reading any text, the Correct. idea that as a reader, I'm not objective. Mm -hmm. uh, I never have been. I never will be. But there is this shaping of encounter with Scripture where the interplay of my reading, I, I'm meant to develop a hermeneutic based within the warp and woof of the Scripture. And that, in some sense, Scripture is mutually read. It, I read it, but it reads me, if not more so than right. I read it. And so that, that I, I'm just so curious how you came to, in one sense, a, a pretty radical hermeneutic that requires this level both of humility and curiosity and yet deep, 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 profound trust and reverence in the Word of God. Yeah, I, all I can say is that my journey has enabled me to be able to uh, develop myself as a reader, uh, to give, you know, to add, allow myself to ask all these questions, um, and then to know how to show up in the pulpit or in the classroom in a way that is engaging and, um, you know, invites both my parishioners as well as my students. I think the, the work is actually very mutually informing. Like, I think I'm a better pastor because I read to prepare to teach, and then uh, being a pastor helps me to be a better teacher, a more compassionate teacher. Um, yeah. Well, it, it, to come back to the program, uh, the certificate that uh, you and two other brilliant colleagues have developed, um, kind of give us a sense of what's in that? What are you, what are you doing? Sure. Uh, in the first course, we're doing the kind of survey of the entire Christian Bible, Old and New Testaments. Uh, you will get a healthy dose of both uh, sort of scaffolding to know how to approach different genres, narrative, uh, verse, uh, legal material, wisdom material, apocalyptic, prophetic. Um, and every class will, almost every class session will uh, both engage the reception history of that material, so how an ancient text uh, functions in the modern setting in, in multiple ways. Uh, and then there's just um, connections to the themes that we find in the text. So when we do the prophets, we're, we're talking about justice. What is How is justice defined in ancient Israel? It turns out it was pretty economic, right? Are you paying a fair wage? Are you treating your neighbor with dignity and respect? And then looking at how the, the justice, um, emphasis on justice, the widows and the orphans was carried out in the civil rights movement and in contemporary, you know, movements for uh, environmental care. So that's the first uh, term. In the second term, we go deeper each uh, class on a particular text. And we practice the kinds of methods of reading, uh, you know, feminist literary criticism, historical criticism, historical comparative readings. And in that way, empower students to to gain confidence in their ability to read for their contexts. In my classes, the emphasis I I tell my students what I'm looking for in your written assignments and your interactions is a robust engagement with the text. Like it can be messy; it doesn't have to resolve. Uh, but I do want to see that you are wrestling with, captivated by a word, a phrase, an image. I want you to be specific and tell me how, 
what your you know what your experience is are are you um made are you angered by this are you frustrated are you grieved by this episode and and i want you to be specific and not just you know as some students will do they'll immediately go to kind of a spiritualized interpretation or talk you know make a theological claim and that's not what we do in my classes it's let's look at the text and then come away with oh you read it this way i read the, the tradition has read it this way what and you are adults you get to decide for yourself so a lot of students need help with that uh owning that authority as readers obviously this would be a great offering for pastors or faith leaders or you know community leaders or people who are encountering these kind of theological questions from your point of view because i know sometimes people need help imagining themselves themselves in a certain setting who do you imagine this certificate being for yeah i i think that um this certificate would be amazing for people who who know that they who can sense that they have a hunger and a curiosity like they've gone as far as they can go with their own reading and they want kind of um in a sense a tour guide who can show them here's something about the terrain here's something about the trail that that i i need exposed to me and then i can find my passion you know digging further or deeper into something so um, i don't presuppose you know some of my students have never read the bible and that's really fascinating right some of my students who come in reading it for the first time, their classmates who come from heavily church backgrounds are like, I'm jealous of you. <laughs> so I, I love that we have this range of experiences in the program, in the classroom. Um, and it's it's not about academic performance. Yes, you know, I, I use Chicago Turabian style for the, the few places where you need to footnote and document. But it is it is about, you know, how robustly have you engaged the text because i believe you cannot leave that encounter unchanged or unaffected it, it, i i would love to take this i mean again it, it, the you uh, are a remarkable teacher and you're with two colleagues uh, that again bring unique and different perspectives uh, do, do you want to talk about your fellow colleagues? I, I could primarily speak about Ron since I've known him for uh, a long time. Um, Ron's actually the reason why I'm at the Seattle School. He connected me with Derek many years ago. And I, I just, he and I have breakfast a couple times a year and we'll invariably talk about all the new books that we've been reading and wrestling with. Uh, I just love how Ron's mind works and just his presence, right? It's, it is provocative, it is engaging. And so um, I, I feel like that's the alchemy or the magic, right? You get kind of, I'm, I'm a little more buttoned down and I'm more kind of systematic and logical in my, in my approach. Um, but we're, I think we're both, we both care about very similar things, right? The word has to make a difference in the real world, you know, mm -hmm. on the street with homeless youth or, uh, you know, helping us to make sense of, all of the heartache, you know, the, the, the tragedy of the world and to give us hope that we are able to um, make a difference. They're able to understand with deeper perspective. Which is something I think people coming to do a certificate in scripture and society at the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology, as you put words to so well, are going to get inherently because that's what we're asking our students to develop. And it's just a another way of saying like yeah how does how does the word speak to the traumatized and how does trauma even become a lens that helps us read and i think in some ways that's what your student was bringing to you like mm -hmm. how does the mm -hmm. trauma of abandonment actually help us to maybe see something uh in this text with what we know of its implications so i think there's a lot of a lot of richness here well it, it as much as it's a good formal category, that is scripture uh, and society. I think you've put it even better in terms of it's really scripture in the street, uh, you know, the reality of what does it mean with my neighbor uh, and is my neighbor 
uh, someone who's a homeless kid on the street, and maybe homeless in part because they've been ejected from uh, an environment because their sexual orientation didn't fit the uh, family's core theological conviction. That's a reality for a lot of homeless kids. So you're already in the realm of how do we bring Scripture into the conversation of a broken Christian so-called nation uh, and into the reality of broken families and into the reality of homeless kids? How do we bring the reality of Scripture into the interplay, and how does the street help us read Scripture? Just as we need to read our own reading, we need to be able to read our own culture and the reading of Scripture in the midst of that. And it feels like you all are taking on, shall we say, not merely a monumental task, but you're taking on a cultural, deeply disruptive and imperative task. And to that end, All we can say is we are so proud, so glad for the privilege of being able to say to folks, check this program out. Dan, your your comment just now, the the phrase that came to mind is, you know, Henry Nouwen, sort of the wounded healer. I feel like we are, we, the faculty are wounded healers. We found healing and we want to help our students who may come in with their wounds to find that capacity for wholeness and than to be present in their communities, whether it's the street or the state house or the, the pulpit, um, to also mediate that kind of healing uh, experience. So grateful. Are you a faith leader or someone interested in exploring scripture through fresh, liberative lenses? Consider learning with people like JP at the Seattle School's new 12 month Certificate in Scripture and Society. This certificate is perfect for those who want to examine scripture with diverse perspectives in an intellectual community that values transformative relationships. Apply before December 1st, 2024. Live online courses begin January 2025. Visit the seattleschool.edu forward slash scripture to get all the details. Center podcast is produced by the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. If you'd like more information about the Allender Center, you can look at theallendercenter.org. Thank you.